Father in heaven, Lord, I just want to thank you so much for this opportunity to gather together. I pray, Lord, that as we um, finish off this day with opening your word, that you would please grant us wisdom, help us to open up our hearts and our minds, uh, send your Holy Spirit to teach us and enlighten us. Um, may we understand what it is you have for us this day, and um, may it help us to be able to um, transform our lives and may it prepare us for what's coming is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Somewhere in the recent past, I think it was in our camp meeting, but I'm not sure, someone brought up, they weren't making any claims, but they brought up Daniel 11, 2, and these three kings and the fourth, being far richer than them. they all, and they were making the inference that you know, maybe somebody like Donald Trump um, and if you're paying attention, even you know, at a glance, um, with the prospect of Hillary's campaign imploding, she actually would be prosecuted. There's a, another billionaire that's talking about coming into the race at the last moment as an independent. Bloomberg. So, so Bloomberg came in as an independent, and they, they had Hillary still there. Trump there. That was the final three. You'd have three people from New York City, but two of them would be far richer than all the rest. So that that's just a, a novel too. But <coughs> when when I heard that idea, I thought, you know, I'm not going to go there. But as you know, a few Sabbaths ago, I went there. But I, if you go back, I don't remember that sermon point by point. But it wasn't really part of the sermon. It was just a a thought to throw in there, and. What, what I find a little bit interesting is that the, in order to make that spot have any validity, you got to you need to mark the time of the end. You have to place yourself prophetically in 1989 in order to see the three kings and then the fourth being the far richer, to plug it into the history of the United States. There's reason, there's justification for trying to plug it into the, to the United States because the two horned powers, the Medes and the Persians, or France, or Israel, the, the two horned powers are typifying the United States at the end of the world. So it's, it's not unreasonable to look at the history of the Medes and the Persians and place them at the end of the world and the, and the role of the United States. But I had a, a personal kind of unsettled position about the time of the end because I had been teaching the time of the end was illustrated by Daniel in chapter 9 for many years and then some in one of the past trimesters here we began understanding that the time of the end probably wasn't 538 but it was 536 I, I got the logic but that challenged what I saw Daniel doing in chapter 9 in the first year of Darius as being a symbol of those that have an increase of knowledge with the prophetic word. Uh, it, if it's two years after that, it kind of puts that in question. Uh, but that, what was kind of interesting to me is by going ahead and introducing that at the opening of, of the worships I was doing, it dovetailed into what Brother Parminder was going to do. He wasn't going to do any of that with you know worrying about these three kings and the fourth being far richer than they are, but he was going to address, in passing at least, this um, 538-536 you know, dilemma that we find ourselves in. So it seemed like, okay, that was the right road to go down for a little while at least. I, I'm not sure where he plans to go as he proceeds. I think it's probably he's going to carry on with the visions. But I'm going to bring this part of it for what I've been presenting at worship to a conclusion, although I'm still going to have it as a point of reference. And what I'm, what I'm, the claim that I'm making here is that I'm willing to believe, and, I, and I've never really settled into this, that the time of the end can be represented by a sequence of events, not simply a point in time as we have traditionally understood it. Um, and, and I'm in the public record kind of preparing the platform for myself to think that a long time ago. When I first started doing the 2520, 
I pointed to this three-year siege of Hosea that, we, that Parminder was dealing with earlier today as the beginning of the 2520 and then argued that we have three years at the end in 1797, 98, and 99. Okay, so I was seeing Jesus illustrate the end of that 2520 with the beginning. I wasn't arguing necessarily that there was a, a period of time at the beginning of the 2520 that begins in 677, but one of the characteristics I thought was there was that the beginning history was somehow typifying the ending history, but I couldn't do much with it because the history of Hosea is clouded in so much, you know, historical controversy. You, you've, seen, you've seen the dilemma where we were at today about struggling about it was for two years later it was going to take place and all that. Well, it's not just that that dilemma is there. There has been arguments about that very prophetic history for years. Okay, so th this is a something that hasn't ever been so uh, fully for anyone. So, point being, when I was looking at the beginning history of the 2520 against the Northern Kingdom being a period of time, and considering that it's typifying a period of time at the end of the 2520 in the 1798 history, at that point I wasn't worried about making a case that this ending history, 1797, 1798, and 1799, was the time of the end. I wasn't thinking in those terms. But now we're here looking at the time of the end, so it seems to be like it was added, added, added logic to that thought. So what I'm saying is if what we're understanding about the relationship of Darius and Cyrus, to me, I have no problem seeing both of those men there in that history because they are there to typify the arrival of the United States as the sixth kingdom of Bible prophecy, the two-horned power of the Medes and the Persians typifying the two-horned power of the United States. And therefore, the history where they're both active, time of the end, no problem. And, and, and you can see, I, can, I get it that the event of Daniel and the lion's den is the is representing the increase of knowledge. It, it, it pretty much, Sister White says it. This is this is the prophetic light that awakened Cyrus to his role. You know, he still had some education about his role, but it all seems to fit for me. So, even though I had some misunderstandings about Daniel 11 verse 1 being in the first year of Darius. And when it's really in the third year of Cyrus, it's still, as Michael said that very first time I brought it up, it still fits. Okay, so um, in connection with that, but getting away from that. And, and another thing I said in, the, in my opening class, I, if you remember, we asked the teachers to always provide, provide a curriculum so their students will know where they're expected to go through the class time. And I said, I don't do that because the, even when I've tried to do that in this particular class, all this is, although this is a worship, we get taken hither and yonder, and I just don't feel like fighting that um, leading of the Lord because that's as you look back over the, and it's amazing to me if you've been here. Some of us have been here since the very first trimester, and a few days ago I was telling my wife because I, I it, it struck me and I thought I'll bet she doesn't know. I said to her, I said, what trimester is this? It's amazing to me, this is the seventh trimester. Okay, and, and we've been watching this thing happen for seven trimesters, but for, the, for at least for me and, my, and Kathy, it, it seems like, you know, it's the fourth or fifth trimester, but it's really, and Tyler's shaking his head, it's, it's, it's been going faster than you really recognize. So, um, there, there's a brother in Africa that sends in articles that's in tune with this message. Brother Tabo knows him. But so does Parminder and Tyler um, from their visit there. But Brother Tabo knows him long term. Um, Brother Blessing. What's his entire name? Goban. Goban? Goban. Goban. He's got a click in it. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, Brother Blessing. Um, and he, said it, he has recently said in an article breaking down... Daniel chapter 2, and recently 
Mark and Lor Lorenz, from what I understand, I don't, I haven't heard that Patrick has, but they've been teaching uh, a presentation on Daniel two, and their teaching is different than what Michael put in the public record at our last camp meeting on Daniel chapter two, and. Uh, Rather than continue to, and I, don't, I haven't looked at Brother Blessing's article, for all I know, it might be a totally, entirely different, maybe three ideas out there about what this is. Maybe it's the same as Michael, maybe it's the same as uh, Mark and Lorenz. Maybe we only got two to deal with. <clears throat> but I guess it's time to go through that here, knowing that at this point, open for correction on anything, any road we go down, um, but there was a time when Noel and Heather were still living here that he did a presentation in, our, in the church here, and as he got to the conclusion of his presentation, um, I from the audience, I saw something and I had him plug it in, and from that point on, um, he saw it as he was writing it up there, everyone saw it. It has to do with Ezekiel 21, and when when Ezekiel 21 got opened up, um, it it created understandings and prophecy that we still haven't we still haven't come to the conclusion on. We can see lines of truth now, um, but no one is. Some people have taken their time to try to look at these, but we've never really settled into them. And what I mean by that is, we came to understand that. The first four kingdoms of Bible prophecy, Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, pagan Rome, um, are repeated in the last four kingdoms of Bible prophecy, Papal Rome, the United States, um, the United Nations, and then the one world government, the threefold union of the beast and the dragon and the false prophet. So that gave us all the, that gave us all the prophetic logic we needed to understand that the entire book of Daniel and the entire book of Revelation has an end of the world application and we zealously began to consider how that applies and of course you can do that with a little bit of confidence until of course you get Daniel chapter 11. You get to Daniel chapter 11. That's like the university level. I haven't seen anyone yet put their foot in the water to try to solve that, but we've got that we understand the logic now that from and the key was Ezekiel twenty one that Babylon, Medo Persia, Greece, pagan Rome, um, that that these charts are speaking what is this? Vertically? And they're speaking horizontally. Mm -hmm. Because Babylon is here, it's here. It's not over here in Daniel chapter eight, but the Medes and the Persians are here, here, here. And Ezekiel 21 allows us to see this, but Ezekiel 21 allows us to see that this is the United States, and this is the United Nations, and this final fourth kingdom is the threefold union of the beast, the dragon, and the false prophet. Okay, so I gave my best shot at what Daniel 7 and Daniel 8, how it lined up at the end of the world, and I handed it off to Michael and Tyler and said, develop this out, and when they were going to go do some presentations at some meetings, and, and they presented that. But they reached a point where, it was at the last camp meeting, right? Where is Michael? Michael, not here? But it was at the last camp meeting, I think, that he presented Daniel too. Am I wrong? Yeah. yeah. Okay. And uh, so I thought, it, at first we got to go look at Ezekiel... <coughs> 21, we won't go into depth, it's a matter of public record, but you need to know that's, that's the starting point for us to dive back into this, and where, where, where we will be heading is looking at this down in here, I don't know where, what Brother Blessing's conclusion is, and I can't articulate Michael's conclusion well enough to try, but, but he is definitely seeing something different in his feet than what Lawrence and Mark are seeing um, based upon their testimony. They, they've looked at each other's material and they, they know there's a difference. I can't, I can't spit it out for you. But we'll wade through this and see if the Lord can't bring us all into unity on, on this subject. And... Uh, it still has a connection with Daniel 11 too, because 
we're, we're trying to settle into what the Medes and the Persians, what all that is telling us. And uh, Daniel 11.2 is about the kings of the Medes and the Persians. It's about something that goes on in the United States. Whether it's Trump or Bloomberg or some other way that that fourth king is being typified by being richer than they all. So let's go to Ezekiel 21. Is it 21 or 23? 21. And this was not necessarily my choice. It seemed providential like this needs to be addressed. Um, I don't know that I would have went here at this time in terms of the worships I'm doing. And my worships are going to morph into classes next Wednesday um, when Brother Parminder goes to Brazil. Um, <coughs> So, let's start in verse well, 18, let's start in verse 24 of Ezekiel 21, um, and read down through verse 27. Uh, Sister White plainly says, What chapter are you? I mean Ezekiel 21. You know 27 first, I don't think. Yeah. Really? Yeah. Oh, okay. 32. Ezekiel 21. 21. 21. Yeah. So, we're going to start in verse 24. But, in case you don't know it, Sister White says it directly. You could know it from the Bible, but I'm going to keep it simple. In verse 25, when we read about the profane, wicked prince of Israel... She directly says who that is. You can get it out of the Bible, but who's the profane, wicked prince of Israel whose days have come? Zedekiah, Zedekiah last king of Israel. Okay, and you have to you have to know that to understand the the overthrown that's going to come in verse twenty seven. So, brother Parminder, you want to start in verse twenty four? Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, because ye have made your iniquity to be remembered in that your transgressions are discovered, so that in all your doings your sins do appear. Because I say that ye are come to remembrance, ye shall be taken with the hand. So, <coughs> if the, the, this is Zedekiah, when is he taken with the hand, and why is he taken with the hand, according to the verse? When is he taken with the hand? Because his transgressions no, when? are discovered. No, when? Pardon me? The Sunday law? Oh, you're jumping ahead. I'm looking at actual of history. Destruction of Jerusalem. What's going to happen to Zedekiah? He's going to get his eyes put... Yeah, to after him. what? He gets captured. I don't In between, he gets captured and his eyes put out. What happens? He gets to watch all his children executed and his eyes are put out. Okay, but, but you're jumping ahead. You're saying this is the Sunday law. Why? Well, because of characteristics. Because of what? Well, um. <laughs> you didn't think I was going to really ask you to follow up, did you? No, why, why, why would you say that? Because of other lines of prophecy that, prophecy that have always already taught you that? Yeah. Okay, but why would you say that, Jonathan? Zedekiah means cleansed. Mm. So okay, his name corresponds to, yeah. to October 22nd, 1844, the mm -hmm. imperfect fulfillment in the Sunday law. Bre Brother Kola, you have something different? His sins are remembered. His sins are remembered. Where, where do we see remembered, Mark? The Sunday, Sunday law. law. Why? What? What's your justification for saying that? Zechariah. Zechariah. Revelation 18. Which Zechariah? King Zechariah. King Zechariah. And not another one. Like the high priest. Also the, the high pri priest. priest. They're both marked there. The names mean remembered, and you're saying Isaiah. <laughs> Or uh, Revelation, Revelation 18. 18, her sins are remembered. Okay, so the remembering is other lines, but when we see remembered, it's it's a good indication that Sunday law, and of course we already know that Zedekiah is typifying the end of Adventism at the Sunday law. You want to read the next verse, verse 25? And thou profane wicked prince of Israel, whose days 
whose day is come when in when iniquity shall have an end. So explain that in the context of our previous discussion. Do you see anything in there? No one? Zedekiah, it's the, the, the root word of cleansed. cleansed, and what takes place in the cleansing of the sanctuary? It, blotting out of sin, iniquity has an end. Right? Brother Kola, number 26. Thus saith the Lord God, remove the diadem and take off the crown. This shall not be the same. Exalt him that is low and abase him that is high. I will overturn, overturn, overturn it. And it shall be no more until the, he come who right it is, and I will give it him. Okay, the, the key to this is no doubt marking Zedekiah and the removing of his crown. What's, his, what's a diadem? Crown. Is it? Yeah. It's kind of redundant, royal. isn't it? Remove the diadem and take off the crown? I thought it was like a rod thing. Or maybe I'm wrong, though. The diadem is the thin, it's thinner than the crown, not that high. The crown is round and the diadem is just the crown. It's not the good for it. Okay, we need to find out what a diadem is. Um, I looked at it, it says... That is official turban of a king or high priest. Ah. Uh, official turban of a king or high priest. So it's a type of crown. Yeah. 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 But you there's two crowns here. You would hold a turban with a diadem. This is only going around to hold it in place. But a crown has, is, is like on, on the 1850 chart, there's a crown. Okay, but we see they're both there, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And what's the diadem according to Brother Chris's definition associated with? Priest, priest, high priest. Church. What's the crown? State. 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 This overthrow of the United States has two horns. Republicanism, oh, Protestantism. It's not redundant. It's those two aspects, right? Okay, so... He dies, he's the last king of Judah, and um, so how, here's, here's how we work this formula, and this is all simple, Sister White explains this over <coughs> in just nice clear words, um, but this is Zedekiah, who's, how, how would I do this? Who's going to who's going to follow Zedekiah? Israel. Hmm? Pardon me. Babylon. Babylon. Okay. So Babylon follows, right? Everyone got that. Mm -hmm. Who was it that that was the ruler that executed the judgment on Zedekiah? Nebuchadnezzar. Okay. So the crown's removed, and Babylon takes the throne. Who follows Babylon? Media Persia. Media Persia. Who follows Media Persia? Greece. And who follows Greece? Greece. Rome. Mm -hmm. Okay. So Babylon gets the crown, but what's going to happen to Babylon? Overturned. It's going to be overturned, overthrown. But how many overthrow are there? Three. Mm -hmm. Three. So you got it overthrow here, overthrow here. That takes you to where? Mm -hmm. Rome. And what happens in the time period of Rome? Christ comes. Christ comes. Okay, overturn, overturn, overturn until he whose right it is shall come. And did Christ appear in the history of Rome? Yes. And what did he do in the history of Rome? This is this is one of the places you can go in this study that we're not going to go, but I'm going to, what was, I'm going to throw it in just for our consideration. Kingdom of grace. The kingdom of grace. Throne of grace is set up right here in this history. Yes? Everyone know that? Okay, throne. I'm, I'm calling it throne of grace. 
because we're in the context of kings. But this literal history is when you what Noel did that allowed this to be really clearly clearly illustrated is he lined it up with what? Revelation 17, where you have seven kings. Five are fallen, one is, and one is yet to come, and the eighth, there's actually eight kings, is of the seven. Okay? So when you do that, this is the first kingdom, this is the second kingdom, this is the third kingdom, this is the fourth kingdom, and what we came to understand, one, two, three, four, that, what's the fifth kingdom? Papal. Papal Rome. So this the papacy, and it's the fifth, I guess I'll put the fifth right there, and we came to understand that Babylon is typifying the papacy. Does it? Yes. Is that a valid application? Mm -hmm. yes. So what kingdom follows the papacy? USA, that would be the sixth kingdom in the terms of Revelation 17. And what's the characteristic, the easy characteristic of the Medes and the Persians? Two horned power. Two horned power. Okay, what follows the USA? What's the seventh kingdom in Revelation 17? United Nations. You know, when we first began grappling with Revelation 17, we got all kinds of flack because the theologians they have two primary incorrect ideas the theologians and adventism all right and the one to me was i didn't take time with it the, the, the primary one of the bri it was just it was a direct contradiction to the spirit of prophecy so rather than even take time to dissect it i just say that's a contradiction to the spirit of prophecy it can't be that one but the primary one that was out there in the conservative adventist circle is that this kingdom is not the United States, what is it? What do they teach? France. France. Okay, so we, we, we battled that for a long time. And it, it, it's capable of still surfacing its head in the right meetings, as opposed to listing these out the way we are. If you make this France, it turns everything upside down. So, but anyway, we battled it out based upon the fact that if you lay out these eight kingdoms of Revelation 17 in the order that we are doing, then the history that you're marking lines up with the history of Daniel 11, 40 to 45. It lines up with the history of Revelation 13, identically. So we had two witnesses, Daniel 11 and Revelation 13 that upheld Revelation 17. And it's pretty clear, if you, if you go through Revelation 17, you will see if you haven't done it, it's a real strong logical argument. It was in place, done, move on, Next point of prophetic understanding. And here we are, years later, realizing that Revelation 17, how it was put in place, is it has to be there in order to open up Ezekiel 21. Now, okay, it had to be there, and we didn't, we didn't know that. So the eighth kingdom is, I'm going to put seven. modern Babylon. Okay, modern Babylon. Threefold union, the beast, the dragon, and the false prophet. Everyone with me on that? What happens here in this history? Second coming. Christ can set up his throne of glory. 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 Okay, so once you. This is, now there's all kinds of prophetic light once you have this formula in place that can be produced, and I am certain that we have not even began to dredge out the implications of what this is yet. But if we're going to begin dissecting Daniel chapter 2, then you, prob you probably needed to see this before we started. This is, this is the logic that I'm certain that Mark, Lorenz, Brother Blessing, and Michael, part of the logic that takes them down through these first four kingdoms to the feet and they're going to make a case one way or another that these feet are somehow representing this this history here okay so 
in order for you to have a point of reference for where we're going to begin to look at these things, you needed to see this. Are there, are there any... Did, was that confusing to you? Any questions about that? You just took the last four kings and put them on there? In Revelation 17... 17? Yeah, the last four is what you just yes. placed there. Okay. In Revelation 17, is a, it, it, let's go there. Just so there's, pro there's probably someone that might be watching this on the web that hasn't looked at this, and, and we will not go through Revelation 17 in depth. But I have a verse in Revelation 17 to me is the most important verse. And I, I've said this many times, and it doesn't matter if it's what I think or that I've said it many times, I'm not saying that. But does anyone know what I would argue is the most important verse in Revelation 17? Three or four. Three or four. Wilderness, yes. In verse three. Let's read verse three. Well, let's read verses one through three. Whose turn to read? We'll do a real quick, uh, a 12-minute... A overview of Revelation 17 in close. So you can see why we're marking these as this, the eight kings. Okay. And there came one of the seven angels which had the seven vials and talked with me, saying unto me, Come hither, I will show unto thee the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters. Okay, now, if you haven't ever thought this through, Verse 1, there's something to think through. There's probably lots of stuff in there to think through that I've never recognized. But one thing I'm certain of is we did not have to be told that this angel was one of the seven angels that dumped out the vials of wrath. But we're purposely told that the angel that's going to come and give this information about Revelation 17 to John is one of the angels that poured out the seven last plagues. Okay, so you, do you see that in verse one? Mm -hmm. It says that there came one of the angels, one of the seven, there came one of the seven angels which had the seven vials. That's the previous chapter. That's chapter sixteen. So what does that tell a student of prophecy? It's connected to Revelation. There's a purposeful connection that you are to understand between chapter sixteen and seventeen, and I argue that the connection is. That in chapter 16, this is where we see modern Babylon divided into three parts. Notice verse of chapter 16. Notice verse 19. 19. You want to read that, Sister Allison? 16, 19. And the great city was divided into three parts, and the cities of the nations fell, and great Babylon came in remembrance before God to give unto her the cup of the wine of fierceness of his wrath. And then if you would read verses 12 and 13, Brother Henry. Uh, 16. 16. 12 and 13. Okay. Um, and the sixth angel poured out his vial upon the great river Euphrates, and the waters thereof was dried up, and the way of the kings of the east might be prepared. And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon, now to the mouth of the beast, now to the mouth of the false prophet. So, Revelation 16, among other things, besides telling us about the seven last plagues, this is where we get the specific information that great Babylon, modern Babylon, at the end of the world, is divided into three parts, and those three parts are the beast, the dragon, and the false prophet. Okay? So, I'm going to step just one step outside of this. In verse 12, when Brother... Henry read verse 12. Who's the kings of the east? Pardon me. Parminder said it, but he didn't say it loud enough. For you to, 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 he didn't say it loud enough for you all to hear, so I'll let you guess. The Medes and the Persians. You heard him or you know it? So who is it? Well, yeah, I mean, but who is it in the context of what we've been studying for the last week? Cyrus and Darius. Okay, and they divert the water, right? Okay, but we're not going there. Anyway, what I want us to see is that Revelation 16 tells us that modern Babylon consists of the beast, the dragon, and the false prophet. And for some reason, in verse 1 of Revelation 17, inspiration wants us to see a connection between the beast, the dragon, and the false prophet. That's my argument. Okay, 
and you see the argument established when you go through these king kingdoms, these eight kingdoms. That's why I'm making this point. We're heading to these eight, eight kingdoms. So, uh, Brother Tabo, will you read verse 2 of Revelation 17 and Jonathan verse 3? With whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of their fornication. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw, saw a woman sit upon a scarlet colored beast, full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. So the reason I think verse 3 is the most important is because John is specifically placed. He's placed in the wilderness, and Revelation 12 Verses 6 and 14 tell us the wilderness is the 1260 years. Okay, from 538 to 1798. And then if we would read on, which we're not going to because of time, by the context of where John finds himself when he's carried to the wilderness, we know that he's at the very end of the 1260 years down here. And we know it because... When he's carried to the wilderness, he sees a woman and she's drunk with the blood of the saints. Okay, and you get drunk after you drink. Okay, and it's a point of, of prophetic record that the persecution takes ends 25 years before. So he's seen the woman when she's already did the persecution. So he's got to be down here in this, in this time period of 1798 somewhere. What, out, what other key is there in these verses that allow us to place him here? It's part of her title. She's the mother of harlots. Okay? And in order to, have, to be a mother, what do you have to have? Children. Okay? In her case, it's daughters. So back in this history, back in here, the Protestant Reformation begins, and churches begin to raise up, and they leave Rome... But by 1798, there's some of those Protestant churches that are already making their way back to Rome to the extent that they can be called the daughters of Rome. She's already a mother. The point is, is when he sees this woman riding this scarlet covered beast and he's in the wilderness, he has to be right down here in 1798 because she's already the mother. She already has daughters and she's already drunk of persecution. Everyone follow that? Yep. Okay, so you have, to, you have to have John marked in order to unravel this, this uh, riddle. And what I'm saying is Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, pagan Rome, and papal Rome are the first five kingdoms of this riddle that we'll read. And when we read it, it's going to say five have fallen. And by 1798, Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, Pagan Rome, and Papal Rome have fallen. But if you don't know that John is marked in 1798, you don't have any way to figure that out. If, if he's not placed at a certain point in history, then you'll be all over the board on what the five have fallen were. And, and you won't really be able to answer what one is, because the sixth one is going to be present in 1798. So go to verse uh, Revelation 17, uh, verse 10 and 11, or 9 through 10 and 11. Let's just do 10 and 11. Uh, let's do 10, 11, and 12. Whose turn? And there are seven kings, five are fallen, and one is, and the other is not yet come, and when he cometh, he must continue a short space. Okay, so the five that are fallen, Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, Pagan Rome, Paper Rome, the one that is, is the USA, and whoever the seventh is, this is the sixth, fifth, fourth, third, two, whoever the seventh is, all we know at this point is that he's going to continue a short space. He don't last long. All right. And next verse. And the beast that was and is not, even he is the eighth, and is of the seven, and goeth into perdition. So even though it says there's seven kings, it tells us now there is an eighth king. And whoever that eighth king is, 
who does he have to be? Of the seven. Has to be of the seven. Okay. And now it's nice to be able to ask the question, what does the number eight represent? Resurrection. Resurrection. Okay. Give me some illustrations of that. Um, that's a good one. Circumcision. Circumcision on the eighth day, which is typifying baptism mm -hmm. and the going through the Red Sea or going through the, the flood of Noah is a type of baptism. And how many people were on Noah's Ark? Eight. Eight, Eight people. And um, when, uh, when was Jesus resurrected? After the same day. On the eighth day, on the first day of the week, which is at one level, the eighth day. So, this power here is the power that's resurrected, but it's got to be one of these seven. Which of these seven is marked as being dead? Papal Rome. Fifth. Papal Rome receives a deadly one. So, we know that this is the return of Papal Rome. And verse, the next verse says... Um, Okay, one hour is a short space. It's ten kings. But how many kingdoms do they receive? It says they have received no kingdom singular. They do not receive ten kingdoms. It isn't these ten kingdoms because these ten kings receive no kingdom. Rece how, no, I'm saying it wrong. They kingdoms, ha which kingdom. have received no kingdom as yet. It's a kingdom singular kingdom. It's a singular yeah. kingdom that they receive. And in 1798, they have not yet received it. And when it comes into history, it's just going to be their short, short space. So. When you have this in place from years ago, and then you add to it Ezekiel 21, you see Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, pagan Rome, and then this fifth kingdom here, you bring back up here, sixth here, seventh here, and the United Nations is the United Nations, it's the entire world. And if you go into the Desire of Ages and look in the chapter... In the outer court, you'll see a very nice passage where Sister White is identifying the Greeks that are in the outer court that want to speak to Jesus as a symbol of the world. Okay, the uh, Greeks are the symbol. This empire of Greece is a symbol of a world empire. In fact, in Daniel 11, when we talk about the king of the north and the king of the south, what are we basing that upon? Where do you have from Jerusalem? The division of Greek, the Greek Empire. Alexander's kingdom. The, that, was the, that was the point of reference from the world. And yes, the, the directions are based upon Jerusalem. But the, the kingdom's divided into four parts initially, east, west, north, and south. And that's the kingdom of Greece. It's the entire world. Okay, so Greece is associated with the world, United Nations world, and then the restoration of papal power in this threefold union actually makes this this here isn't really sequ sequential kingdoms. It's how the last kingdom comes together. Because this is the false prophet of Revelation 16. This is the dragon. And this is the beast. So this is telling about how the threefold union comes together. So it's not really the sixth, seventh, and eighth kingdom. What is it? It's the sixth six. six. six kingdom. So they're all the sixth kingdom, which makes them six. Six, six. Right? So that, this understanding had to be in place before Ezekiel 21 is opened up. But when Ezekiel 21 is opened up, it is now too strong that not only does Daniel chapter 2 speak in this direction to us, this chart speaks, or I'm, I should be saying, not only does this chart speak to us in this direction, it now speaks to us in this direction which adds a great deal of weight to what Sister White says when she says, I saw that this chart was directed by the hand of the Lord and should not be altered because there's no way that I can believe that the pioneers were seeing these kind of implications when they laid this out. But it works very well as a, um, a tool 
to describe this. So what we are on, what we will be, take up in the following worships is Daniel two, and trying to figure out how these feet uh, correspond to this second application of these first four kingdoms, knowing that there is already some different ideas about it among us. Okay. Brother Gabriel, you want to come? Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for this precious day and we thank you that you're opening your words to us that we may understand these truths. Help us to go forward and to understand the relation between these these things and give us a good night of rest as the day has come to an end. We ask in Jesus' name, Amen. Amen.